Just before we get started on this series, I just wanted to um, talk to you for a moment about um, the Zoom etiquette. Um, this is a foundation of love and respect, and so please respond kindly if, um, rather than react if you disagree with anything that someone says. Um, please introduce yourself before speaking. Avoid making loud noises and mute yourself if you're not speaking. The mute button is on the left bottom corner of your screen. We would like this to be an interactive series. And so as the speakers are speaking, if you have a question about something that they're saying, please feel free to write that in the chat box and we will ask the speakers those questions during the Q&A session. If you do have the bandwidth to be able to get on video, we ask that you get on video as we're trying to cultivate a collaborative community. Also, if you're having any IT issues, if you would please um, message through the chat, the um, host, SSAC Cambodia, and we will see what we can do to help with those IT issues. Um, we'd like to thank the GE Foundation for sponsoring this session and also thank Vanderbilt University Medical Center and Vanderbilt Institute for Global Health for putting on this wonderful lecture, lecture series that we are in session five on. Um, and Without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Mark Newton. He is a professor of anesthesiology and pediatrics. He's lived and worked and, ed and educated in East Africa for 22 years. Dr. Newton is involved in capacity building activities and research in a number of countries in Africa. During his time at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, he is a consultant in pediatric anesthesiology and the Director of Global Health and Development for the Department of Anesthesiology. He's also a very dear friend to us at Assist International, and so welcome, Dr. Newton. We're very excited to have you speak today. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you for introducing me, and uh, welcome to this session. I know it's early in the morning there. I just want to introduce two of my co-presenters. The first are, they're both pediatric anesthesiologists. They're both good friends of mine. The first is Dr. Saida Asaf, she's an associate professor and head of the Department of Anesthesia at the Children's Hospital and Institute of Child Health in Lahore, Pakistan. She's also an assistant professor at Arkansas Children's Hospital in the United States. The second one is uh, Dr. Christopher Chandra. He is a, also a consultant pediatric anesthesiologist. He's head of the Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care at University Teaching Hospital in, in um, Lusaka, Zambia. He's also the National Coordinator of Anesthesia Services in the Ministry of Health in Zambia. So you will hear from them over the next uh, hour. So next slide. So we have no financial, no conflicts of interest to talk about. Next slide. So what we're going to do is go through the, the objectives. So the objectives that we're going to go over today are describe the impact of COVID-19 on surgery. We're going to talk about the uh, specific impact of uh, on healthcare providers and, and the operating room with COVID-19. The third thing we'll go over is really possible algorithms, how about surgical systems with COVID-19 specifically related to uh, the operating room setting. And then we're going to have our co-presenters talk about uh, really what's going on in Pakistan at a hospital level, how to organize surgery at that level. And then the second presenter or the third presenter will be uh, from Zambia. And he'll discuss at a national level how to basically organize a country for COVID-19. Next slide. So I know the world is changing and certainly we have to see how we're going to adjust to this. Next slide. And it's going to take all of us. And so I, I am thankful that we're able to get together as a group and develop this uh, network. And I would just encourage each of you to uh, communicate through the WhatsApp so we can form this ne network so we can kind of tackle this problem as a, uh, a team. Next slide. So certainly COVID is affecting healthcare workers. And uh, this is a geospatial map by Johns Hopkins that shows 
about a week ago where COVID is placed. And we can see that certainly in, in this map, Africa is spared somewhat. And you can see that it's mainly in the Northern Hemisphere. But in all of these areas, there are healthcare workers. And uh, certainly based upon the information coming from China, there's a significant number of healthcare workers that have been infected. And also in Italy, they basically have said that 20% of the healthcare workers who have been in Italy have been impacted by this virus. I received word today that even in the country of Kenya that some of the healthcare workers there in the national health system are uh, considering striking because of the concern about the safety of healthcare workers. Next slide. And so this is a slide that's showing specifically Southeast Asia and Africa. And, and those of you who are on the talk from Southeast Asia, you have seen the increase in COVID-19. And you can see that this is just a, a little bit over a week ago that the numbers are increasing significantly. So it's very timely that we were able to discuss um, COVID-19 and in in how it relates to surgery at this time. Next slide. So this is a new study that was just uh, published a few days ago, and it talks about, this is, this is Africa, but I think it applies also to Southeast Asia. And they're looking at different factors, factors such as uh, international exposure. Certain countries have more international exposure than others. The health systems, the urban density, how dense are the urban settings, the uh, population age, uh, if it's a young population or an older population, and basically if there's conflict in countries. And they basically mapped this out according to those factors. And you can see the, the reference there, but it's basically showing that certain countries that for certain factors will be considered at higher risk for getting COVID-19 compared to other countries. Let's go to the next one. So as, since we're gonna talk about surgery and COVID, I wanted just to show you kind of the numbers. And you can see from these numbers, these are the estimated total surgical need. And so certainly this is not the number of surgeries that are happening in Africa and Southeast Asia. But even if you look at the need in Southeast Asia of 25 million surgeries needed, this is a significant uh, number in, as, as it relates to uh, patient population. This is out of the Lancet Global Health. So let's go to the next slide. And then the next is the number of operating rooms. And you can see that uh, this is the number of operating theaters in South and Southeast Asia and in Africa, greater than 45,000 operating theaters. And so when we talk about what we're going to do for COVID in operating theater ecosystem, this is a huge number of uh, operating theaters that we're discussing. And, uh, and that's why we want to prepare you as, as the best we can. So next slide. So this is a study that was, was published in 2015, and it basically is looking at the implications of certain types of surgeries, infectious and parasitic diseases on the top, and then maternal conditions on the bottom. From my time in East Africa, when we are collecting da data, many of the surgeries are not elective. And so when we hear of high-income countries discussing about elective surgeries and postponing elective surgeries, and basically all surgeries, they're really, it's a, it's a fairly small number of purely elective surgeries. But in Africa, you can see that when you, when you look at some of these infectious and parasitic surgeries, it's, it's, a, it's a huge percentage. And so these are, these are patients that can't wait. And so when we talk about not operating in, in Africa and other low and middle income countries, really these are patients that need us to operate. So it may not be something that we can just decide that we're not going to operate. And also cancer, cancer oncology, surgical conditions in low and middle income countries is very, very high. And so those are patients that can't wait either. So we're going to have to be educated on this COVID-19 and also how we're going to take the next steps as it relates to the need for surgery. Next one. So here is a, a diagram that was just recently published um, from the Canadian Journal of Anesthesia. And, and you can see it's a very complicated slide. It has a huge emphasis on numbers and, and what you do in the preparatory phase and the interoperative phase and the postoperative phase. It's all related to workflow. And in many of the countries, they can't, uh, there's not this number of personnel and certainly all the infrastructure that's needed to do this. And so, 
I would suggest that you use this as a template, but not necessarily what you would need to do in your own country. You're going to have to develop a template that's appropriate for your specific ecosystem. But let's just try to break this down and specifically talk about certain factors related to a, a template such as this. Let's go to the next one. So let's specifically talk about uh, where is the risk. And uh, so this was also recently published out of JAMA. And it talks about um, this whole idea about uh, droplets and, and things like that and where we're going to be exposed in the operating theater. Well, the numbers that are coming out of this article is showing that if you're, if you're admitted to the hospital with severe respiratory distress as an inpatient from COVID-19, that 8% of the patients will require intubation and mechanical ventilation. And the concern for healthcare providers is really this aerosol generating procedures. And these are, we'll talk about that in a minute, but it's much more infectious than coughing, sneezing, talking. These are procedures that really produce a lot of droplets and there's really no definition for what is an aerosol generating procedure. But some of them would be an intubation, extubation, mechanical ventilation, bronchoscopy, and tracheostomy. Tra tracheostomy. And, and the, the one that's the highest based upon studies that have been done uh, would be the intubation. And so we all have been told that the, there's high viral loads of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 and the sputum and upper respiratory infections of these patients. And so this whole idea about being concerned about intubations is an appropriate one. Next slide. So this is a study, and, and I know people have asked about simulation and, and how we use simulation to determine what the problems are. And so this was also recently published in JAMA. And what this was a group out of Israel, and they looked at two different scenarios. They put a type of droplet that they could see with a UV light in the airways of these uh, sim, sim mom or sim, chi, sim child, and they, they developed these two scenarios. So the scenarios, the first scenario was a 74-year-old male who had respiratory distress. He was in the emergency room and he needed to be intubated. So during the management of the patient, the patient coughed twice, and there was one doctor that was going to be involved in intubating the patient. The other doctor was going to be involved in and standing next to him, pushing some drugs. There would be, was another nurse involved. And then there was a nurse that was in the room that basically was uh, taking vitals and, and drawing up drugs. So there were a total of four providers for this one scenario. And then they basically did the se second scenario with a pediatric patient. So basically the same thing. And they put these um, little droplets kind of in this for secretions in the nose and the mouth. And so then after the scenario, before they removed their PPEs, they, they got a UV light and they took photographs of the, of the participants. So there were eight of them, four in each scenario. So let's go to the next one. And so then what they did is they looked at where these droplets were landing. And you can see from these photographs that there were a significant amount of droplets on the neck and areas where the PPEs did not cover. And you can see the picture that's uh, on the bottom right of the different colors on the neck. And so any place that was exposed around the ears and on the neck, that's where the droplets landed. And also the droplets landed on the shoes. And so they didn't really take pictures. Part of the simulation study was not to take pictures of when you take your PPE off. But the suggestion is that when you take your PPE off, more of these droplets fall on different parts of your body. So the message is that if you're going to wear PPE, that it needs to cover areas of your neck, back of your neck like this, that normally are, don't, are, that are not covered by some of the diagrams. So the next slide. So this is the, uh, the diagram that we've all seen by the, by the CDC. And it shows you kind of what you need to wear as far as gloves and an isolation gown. The difference between the two is the the N95 mask. And, and we know that that seems to be the part that most people are concerned about. And in fact, many countries don't have enough N N95s. And so when we do have N95s, we're gonna to have to determine how to conserve these. And so the Partners in Health Group have, have uh, produced a document that kind of gives some basic, simple tasks that will, will be helpful for that. And uh, what it is is talking about the, uh, as far as the tasks that need to be taken care of. And so 
when you do a task, you need to do, do a task whereby that you, uh, if you're gonna take a blood pressure, vital signs, that they are actually done one time in the room. You need to limit the number of people who are in the operating room. And we'll talk about that later. But basically, if someone's in the operating room, they're, if they're not necessary, they don't need to be entering the operating room. They also talk about uh, always wearing a face shield. So people have asked about face shields and how you should do that. And also you should wear a surgical mask above the face shield. I think that's going to be very, very important uh, as far as that goes. And what types of glasses you need. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, what types of glasses we should use and, and face shields and things like that. Can everybody see these slides? Yes. Okay. Okay. So let's go to the next slide. Okay. Great. So basically, the uh, the clear plastic face shield that you see on the left side of your screen are very expensive, and we, we may not have enough of those of those face shields. And you can see the N95 just beyond the face shields. Well, this was a, a group in Kenya. They got together and started making face shields, and so they can be made. They're basically made with this plastic PVC binding. And uh, you can buy boxes of these that you normally do on a report and get masking tape and foam and glue and some bands. And so they're able to make about eight, ma eight, eight of these shields for one US dollar. So in that sense, if, if you don't have a face shield and that's one of your limitations, you should have these made. And it doesn't take expensive equipment to make these, but you can make thousands of these for just a small amount of money. So this is an example of that with a photograph of people in the operating theater using these face shields. Just go to the next slide. And so this is an N95 mask that we've uh, been told about. And certainly there's different standards. We, hear, we see about the N95 and you, you basically see about this FF2 and FF3 and what that means. And, uh, and basically those are European standards for the same thing. We've had questions on the chat about different types of masks and, and how you should make them and, and if they're valuable. But basically none of these masks other than the N95 will block out the virus. These are masks and they show from surgical mask all the way down to silk and scarf. They'll, they'll block bacteria because bacteria are much bigger than this virus. And so really to block the virus, you need to have an N95 mask. And so the way we're going to have to, to work this situation, if we have very few N95 masks, is to try to reuse them. So let's go to the next slide. And so this is also from the CDC, and it talks about ultraviolet germicidal radiation. It gives you some details about how, many, uh, how much energy per centimeter square you need and the different viruses that they've tested and how, how that it, it has worked. But uh, this, is a, this is a formula and advice sent by the CDC, but how, we, how do we do it in, in practical sense and in a high income country or in a low income country? So let's go to the next slide. So this is a slide that, that shows basically how these N95 are being uh, reused and, and it's over a period of time. And so I put a link there, it's called nebraskamed.com. You can go to that web, website and it's, it's probably 10 pages long that it talks to you about how to use UV light and, and basically reuse these N95s. But these devices are very expensive and so there's a YouTube channel there that talks about a cheaper way to do this. And you can see on the right side of the screen how people would write their names and then put a little tally mark to determine how many times you've re-sterilized this. And they basically say you can use these four times. You use it the first time, and they can be re clean, clean, it can be cleaned three times, and so you can get four uses out of it. Nobody knows whether you can get 10 uses out of it, or eight uses out of it, or 15 uses out of it. But this group in Nebraska has just said that that would be the maximum number that they would suggest. But the situation is most likely you can use it more than, more than four times. But if you look at this picture in the middle, it has these little kind of holders there. It's all based upon being a certain distance apart and a certain amount of UV light. So it's fairly complicated and the wall should be painted with reflective paint. And so just if you want more details, 
I'm not an ex expert on this, but basically you go to this site and they can give you the details. So let's give the next one. So people have asked about the anesthesia machine. When you have an an anesthesia machine and filters, where you should put the filter. This is a, a diagram that's put from the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation. And we all know that we work in situations with limited viral filters. You need to have a filter that, that says on there that it's this viral filta filtration efficiency of about 99.9%. You have limited numbers of filters, they should all go on the expiratory side of the circuit. And, and you don't need to put one on the inspiratory side. Most places that I've worked in Africa, gas sampling, of entitled CO2 is something that's not done because sometimes it's just not available. But if it is available, you may consider not using gas sampling because that's going to affect contamination in the anesthesia machine. And so if I was working in a place with limited resources, limited viral filters, I would personally eliminate using entitled CO2. And I would just use clinical signs to determine if I had the patient intubated or not primarily because you'd have to use more filters. People have also asked, do you have to use one filter per patient? I would say if there's limited filters, it's, it's safer just to use that one filter. Uh, they'll recommend one filter, one patient, but most likely you're not gonna be able to do that. You're gonna have to use a filter for a number of patients and just keep it on the expiratory side of the machine. But that's something that wouldn't be recommended by any company to use more than, more than, than using the filter on more than one patient, but that would be something that I would certainly consider in a situation where I didn't have a large number of filters. Next slide. So this is a slide that talks about the specific intubation and, and COVID, and, and this was a algorithm that was put together by a team in the UK, and we're gonna, we're gonna go through that algorithm briefly, but basically this photograph is describing, normally we're taught to put your hands and use this C shape in, number, in photograph B, how to use your hands. They're suggesting now that you don't do that, that you use two hands, have one hand on one side in this B pattern, like you see in A, and then the other hand on the other side and make the same pattern. So you don't want the droplets to come out on the other side. So I would suggest that if you're gonna ventilate a patient that use two hands, you have someone else squeeze the bag. So that algorithm on the right side is, is also, you'll, I'll allow you just to go through it, but it, it specifically is related to people in high income countries that have capnography and have video laryngoscopes. So let's go to the next slide. And basically I put some comments on this. So capnography may not be available. You're just gonna have to use your clinical judgment on that. And, and many places in the world don't have capnography. So don't assume that you need capnography to take care of COVID-19 patients because you do not. The second thing is, uh, you know, use a stethoscope. And people sometimes say, well, just watch the chest going up and down, that's okay. But you're not gonna have a video laryngoscope in many situations. So you can still take care of patients without a video laryngoscope. Many algorithms that are being produced now are going to talk about using a video laryngoscope. That's something that is nice, but it's not necessary. Second thing is if you need to have a clamp available, if you do have to disconnect the circuit and you have an endotracheal tube in place, you should clamp the endotracheal tube if you do have to disconnect and so these droplets do not come out and then you, you unclamp it when you hook up the circuit. So these are some just some different variables associated with the algorithm that was in place. So let's go to the next one. So what about the droplets? There's many different descriptions and people that are sending out ideas uh, on WhatsApp groups and things like that. Well, this is one idea. This is just uh, some plexiglass that have been developed with a couple of the holes. People have found that very difficult to try to, in simulation even, to try to use. And so that's just one idea. There's a YouTube link that goes through that. So let's go through the next one. The next one is this PVC piping that you can get at any sort of hardware store and you can make you a diagram or, or some sort of a holder for a, on the far right side, there's a curtain, like a clear shower curtain that you can put over. You'd have to cut two holes in the top so you could put your hands in there. But that's another idea that people have come up with. Okay, let's go to the next one. The next one is a mayo stand. So use a mayo stand and a clear kind of, um, 
plastic drape. You'd have to cut holes in it again. You put this mayo stand above the patient's head. You kind of, kind of tape it down around the outside so the droplets do not come out. And then once you intubate, you leave it on. At the extubation, you leave it on. And at the end of the case, when you throw away the endotracheal tube, you throw away everything together. So that's another technique that you can use to minimize the amount of droplets that are spread throughout the operating theater. So let's go to the next one. <coughs> so this is a guideline, so it's put out COSEXA. This is a, a group in, in Africa, but basically it, it's a very simple way of looking at which cases should be done and should not be done. Talks about PPE and talks about laparoscopy. I will just leave that with you to look at when you, when you review the slides. So let's go to the next one. Also, this is talking about cancer treatment. Is there certain types of cancers that you can, you can delay and there are certain types of cancers that you shouldn't delay? And this is put out by the Annals of Inter Internal Medicine that talks about that. So I'll let you also review that later. Next slide. This is a slide that's also put out by a group with COSEX and it also talks about different types of surgeries, different types of anesthetics, and then it talks about based upon the color of different types of PPE. And, and basically, if you're gonna do an aerosolized generating procedure, you need to use the maximum amount of PPE you have available. <coughs> Okay, the next slide. And this is a simple algorithm that was put together here at Vanderbilt that talks about uh, if you have opportunity to, to use testing. And again, I'm gonna let you go through this, but basically you look at all patients and if you have asymptomatic patients, you call them and you ask them, you screen them. They don't have any symptoms at all. Basically they can have surgery. The concern is certainly someone coming in that's asymptomatic that is still positive. And certainly that's going to be an issue for a long time. And so basically that's gonna be N95 mask for most people. But again, I'll let you go through this algorithm and, and look at how you would decide at your own institution when you can test, when you should not test. But basically, if there's testing available, it's going to change the way you do this. Right now at our institution, everyone that's coming to surgery is being tested for, if it's an elective surgery, is being tested for COVID. Once the, surgery, once the COVID test comes back as being negative, then basically they can come in to have surgery. Emergency surgeries obviously are different. People are still being tested, but if it's an emergency surgery, you know, it needs to be done and people need to be prepared for assuming that it's a COVID positive or a possible positive type patient. Okay, let's go to the next one. So this is a slide that summarizes that basically if you're suspected um, positive or confirmed positive, you need to wear an N95 face shield, gown, gloves. You need to basically have everybody out of the room when you're intubating and extubating, and then you need to clean the room and wait for 30 minutes. And then all the way down until you do other procedures where patients you, you really do not know and uh, or it's, it's just you haven't been able to test them or anything like that. This would be someone where you, even now at Vanderbilt, the anesthesia team, when they're doing the intubation, extubation, they have everybody in the room stand out to have the most experienced person intubating the patient. They really have the patients using a cuffed endotracheal tube. They don't have the people come back in until it's cuffed. If it's a high risk procedure, everybody in the room wears PPE and N95 for the entire case. If you're in the room, you wear PPEs and N95. Next, next slide. The next two slides also are for your reference, and they basically talk about when you can start doing testing. Different colors represent different types of PPE based upon where they are. If, there's, if they're not at a high risk or they're COVID negative, it's down here in the yellow. If they're at a higher risk, COVID positive, it's red. And so go to the next slide. And this is a diagram that you'll be able to use to determine based upon where they fell on the, on the previous slide, if you should use uh, green, which is at the top, you should use red, orange, or yellow. And this is gonna talk about in-room PPE equipment and personnel. This is also put together by people here at Vanderbilt to help us all understand the entire team, where we are on the, on the chart based upon the COVID positive, negative, or suspect. So let's go to the next one. We're almost through, and then we're going to have Saeed to talk to us about Pakistan. This is also a recent article that was published in Annals of Surgery. 
Again, a very extensive flow sheet, specifically designed for low and middle income countries. Again, you should use this as an example, and it may or may not work in your situation, but it may be helpful. And then the last point is just, you're going to have to design a strategy for your own hospital. Everything that I've placed up here, there's some variation from a high income country, but you basically will need to decide what's going to work at your specific hospital. So I will turn this now over to Dr. Saida and she's going to talk to us about uh, her hospital in Pakistan. So the next slide, one more slide right there. Okay, thank you, Saida. You can, we can unmute mute you. There we go. I thank you, Mark, for this opportunity. Uh, so I work at a very high volume uh, tertiary pediatric center. You can see this is our outpatient unit. We see about, <coughs> about 1,100 patients a day in the outpatient clinic. Uh, there are at least three to five patients on every bed inpatient bed. Uh, that's a real picture. Uh, so, and it's an 1100 bed hospital. Next slide, please. So the things that we wanted to talk about was how to establish perioperative COVID patient flow, all these slides that Mark went into. Uh, how are you gonna implement that at your local level? Uh, how to procure and distribute PPE uh, training your staff on donning and doffing, uh, define your intraoperative standards, and then human resource management. How are you gonna manage your workforce and come up with guidelines for people who are pregnant and who have comorbidities or are over the age of 60. Next slide, please. So we initially could not get the administration on board around the 13th of March, we started talking to the administration that COVID was, was a possibility. We needed to change our current practices and uh, they really did not get that we needed to change things. So what we did initially within our department was we started a WhatsApp group. Uh, we called it the COVID-19 uh, uh, leadership group. It had four lead anesthesiologists and one lead anesthesia technician or assistant. Next slide, please. And the main goal for that team was, was we were gonna establish what our PPE was going to be, what we were, uh, the responsibility of that team was to uh, establish uh, our own perioperative guidelines and training of the staff, and then to keep on revisiting this. So the first thing that we did was, you can see we are a very resource limited setting. We set up a screening of the patients. Every, we could not stop the elective surgeries like Mark said. So what we did was everybody who was coming in for pre-op surgery, we set up a room outside of our pre-op room. There were, we put two people in there who were gowned, were wearing masks. We had a ther thermometer, uh, a pulse ox, and we were, and so all of them were asked about a history, illness, sick contact, their temperature and their oxygen saturation, and then they were allowed to go on for their surgery. I will tell you up front that as soon as the patient's families realized that anybody with fever wasn't coming through, <laughs> the next couple of weeks, we, we started getting people who would give their kids uh, Tylenol or paracetamol or would lie about uh, their symptoms and would come through. And, and there really isn't much what you, you can do. So it's really important that you, so we were, so initially the surgeons were, weren't on board and then went, once the surgeons and the administration came on board, we decided collectively what was urgent, what was semi-urgent and what really absolutely needed to get done. And those were the cases that we started prioritizing. Next slide, please. So we do not have any negative pressure rooms. Uh, we looked at our air exchange rooms and realized that they were not built right. And their, their air was actually all circulating back within the air exchange rooms. So we decided that we were going to go with the OR that was closest to the exit and the entry of the OR. This allowed us to um, use an OR for, for COVID patients with the least bit of overlap with our other operating rooms and with our PACU and also 
the pathway to the rest of the hospital. The hospital came up with a, we have a, so it's a three floor building and the topmost floor was reserved for private patients. That entire floor was converted into a COVID floor. So the, if there is anybody who suspected COVID or COVID positive, they come into the hospital through a separate entry. Uh, they use a separate hallway, uh, a separate elevator that the rest of the hospital and patients cannot use. They go straight up to that third floor. All the COVID ICU and the isolation beds are up on the third floor. Uh, and that is what allows us, so if anybody is COVID positive, they come directly to the OR, to that one OR, go through that protected hallway, and then go back up. So even with our very limited resources, we were able to establish a pathway which was completely different for the COVID patients. And I am, and it's something that's implementable. Next slide, please. Uh, another thing that's really crucial for us uh, one of the problems that creeped up was we could not find plastic to cover our supplies inside the OR. So as you can see, that is one of my nurse anesthetists. She, uh, she was usually the second person in the room. She's sitting outside along with our cart. Uh, we moved the surgical cart out of the room too. So anything that is not essential is not inside the room. Anybody who is not essential is not inside the room especially when we're intubating, when we're extubating. Another thing to do is, is to announce to the rest of the team when you're going to intubate so that they can step out. Announce to the team when you're gonna extubate so that they can also step out if there's somebody in the room who does not need to be there. Uh, it's really crucial. We come from cultures where a lot of people are in the room as anesthesia technician, as OR nursing staff, or they need to move out when they are not needed in the room. Next slide, please. So the next biggest challenge was PPE. As of today, we do not have, we only have two N95 masks for each anesthesia provider. Um, this is not what you want to do, but this is what it is. Um, so we started and we did not, when we initially asked the hospital, they said they didn't have the money for it. So what we did was, we asked family and friends, we pulled in our money. Uh, if you look at the slide on the right side, that's, <laughs> that's a, uh, that was made out of plastic bags by one of the girls who is in the middle and she put it on her husband and we decided, okay, this is what we're going for. So in the middle of Jan March, this was our PPE. And then we made the face mask, the face shield that she's wearing, we made our own shoe covers. These are made up of trash bags initially. And then we were later on able to then, and then you, if you look over onto the left side, we got these made, uh, but we realized very, very quickly that they were very, very hot. Uh, so what we've ended, ended up doing is, is we've gotten our own PPE side stream going. We're not depending on the hospital administration. All of my team now has at least a couple of uh, hazmat suits that are washable. And uh, everybody has two N95 masks along with a face shield. All of us get surgical gloves. Uh, it took some vining to the hospital, but uh, complain, complain, and complain so that you can get the things that you need and you cannot get problems that you're gonna get run into, especially when you're buying N95 masks. There are a lot of fake PPE out there, okay? Especially with N95. What you can do is you can, there's a lot number that's written on the N95. You can check it. You can go online, you can put that lot number in and you can see if that's actually a real thing. Uh, the prices have gone up and there's so much demand that even my vendor that I use all the time, he could not initially provide me. So reach out to a lot of different people. You never know who is gonna come up with what you need. Next slide, please. So, there, so despite doing all these things, there are certain challenges that are gonna pop up. If you look at my slide over onto the left side, uh, so this is a pay, this is actually out of an induction. Um, and the, so our anesthesia technician, you can see he's not wearing any eye shield. 
uh, it's really hard to get everybody on the same page. Although both the slides on the left-hand side are from my hospital, one team is wearing everything from head to toe. The other team is sort of picking and choosing what they like doing. Um, it just takes a lot of reinforcement over and over again. One of the things that we came up with was when we did our training, we did a checklist and everybody had, a, there was a sign up sheet. Everybody had to be trained for doffing and donning. Uh, we came up with a buddy system. So when you come in and you don and doff, there is somebody else who's watching you in that area. And we, we set up a separate area. That's also very crucial. And that's coming up in our hospitals again and again. We, you need to define where your team is going to dawn and off every day. Um, people are coming in, if they wear their PPE, they go into the operating room, they come out of the same operating room, they're going into the break rooms, having a cup of tea, it's breaking all rules. We're exposing everybody else despite the PPE. And that is not acceptable. So if you look at the middle slide, these are nurses who are going home in their gowns, in their so-called uh, COVID uh, uh, protective gowns. And when we asked them, they said, well, we're going to go home and we're going to wash the gowns. Well, they've taken care of these patients. They're going home and they're going to go on the bus through the corridors and they're exposing everybody and their families to, to these infected gowns. So another thing that we asked the hospital and we were able to get from the hospital was that they do our laundry at the hospital. So we take our gowns off and we give it to the hospital and they have it ready for us the next day. Another way, in, uh, training your staff is crucial. You can have, there's not going to be enough PPE that that's, but whatever PPE there is, you also have to train your staff. So if you look over to the picture on the right side, this was at another hospital. This, this was a gentleman who was taking care of a COVID patient for a C-section. And you can see that he's got everything. He's got his eye goggles, his mask, and everything, but he's got them all wrong. The mask is not covering his nose. The, the N95 needed to be the innermost mask and the surgical mask needed to be the one outside. And you don't see that. So he has inadvertently actually been exposed and did not really have the respiratory uh, protection that he needed during this known COVID uh, C-section. Uh, so procuring PPE is one thing. Training your staff to follow uh, infection protocols is another thing. You have to come up with your own pathways. You have to continuously come up with a system in which your team members follow these rules, follow infection protocols, and continuously train them. There is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of local belief system that it is hard for them to overcome that. So the, the only way to overcome is that every week have a checklist and make sure that your team revisits that. And, and we try, what we've tried to do is, is come up with a WhatsApp group and say, Here's what I saw somebody doing right, and here is what I saw somebody doing wrong. And we post those, and then we, and it's sort of a challenge for all of us to move on from that. Next slide, please. All right. So like I said, the couple of things that we focused on that we thought was crucial to our system that we, I mean, this is not a system set up for infection control. Uh, we really, uh, we came up with a checklist for donning and doffing. And I had somebody come in and we, we basically trained five master trainers from one master trainer. And then we assigned those five master trainers to train other people. And now actually my department is the major trainer for the entire hospital for donning and doffing. And you cannot have enough master trainers, to be honest. So, the, so when you are doing your donning and doffing, also identify people who are going to be your master trainers. And once you have trained them and they're your master trainers, have them go and help the rest of the hospital to be trained. Uh, another crucial thing, which is very neglected in my hospital in usual times, is the cleaning of the operating room and handling of the laryngoscope. Uh, so we do have video laryngoscopes. Um, I don't know how it is in your setup, but 
Um, we were lucky enough that we did have two sets of video laryngoscopes. All our intubations are being done by, by video laryngoscopes to uh, minimize uh, the exposure. Uh, I can tell you that for like two to for about two thousand dollars, I can get a cheap Chinese video laryngoscope in Pakistan. So if that if you have if you don't have one, maybe it is. And this is something that the government is asking us: What do you need? So if this is one of your needs, and then go ahead and ask for it. It's not the most expensive thing that they're going to get for you. Uh, sign up sheet and a buddy check system. I cannot emphasize the buddy check system enough. Pair pair up your people wisely. Pair up somebody who is sort of not prone to follow the rules or is not so meticulous with somebody who is, and have them. Um, and, and so that that also improves your system, and it allows some people who slack off when you're not there all the time with a big stick to stick to the rules. Uh, another thing that we did was we put up cognitive aids. We put up pictures uh, in our donning and doffing area and outside and inside each OR. Next slide, please. Okay, so it's gonna be, a, it's a stressful time. Uh, your team is gonna freak out. We had two people resign from our team as soon as this crisis started. Uh, people have very real fears and their fears are not, uh, are not based on fantasy, they're real. They're, we know that healthcare workers are at, a, are at a high risk. Um, I would highly recommend WHO has a great uh, resource for how to deal with stress. If it's something that you find helpful, use it for your department. Infection control is now a priority, which it never was. So the real question to ask yourself is, what do we use this opportunity to improve the infection control in our hospital? Thank you. Back over to Sherry. Thank you, um, both Dr. Newton and Dr. Asaf. I really appreciate that. Um, wonderful session here. Um, Dr. Newton, are we going to hear from Dr. Chandra now or during the question and answer time? Yeah, I think we, we can have uh, Dr. Chandra talk for about the next five, seven minutes, and then we'll have some questions. Excellent. Would you like to introduce him then? I'll let you introduce him, Mark, if that's... Yeah, let's, let's see if we can unmute him. And um, Dr. Chandra, are you there? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Good morning. Go, go ahead, Christopher. Yes, I, I'm, I'm actually Christopher from Zambia. I'm presenting on uh, just a short uh, presentation on our case here. So we are in Central uh, Southern Africa with a population of about 17 million. Not so much as compared to Eastern Asia. Next slide. Yeah, so uh, as we have already seen, uh, COVID-19 is an emerging crisis. And uh, one of the issues here is really imaging surgery and preserving precious human resource commodity. And uh, PPE availability is also a challenge and provision of emergence and routine anesthesia becomes quite a big challenge. Now we also look at the impact of quarantine on anesthesia workforce in no resource settings. And generally the cancellation of all electives and uh, Mark has really given us a very good account of the effect of uh, cancellation of the surgeries. I think from our perspective, uh, there is quite a very big surgical burden. And uh, we're not too sure of the long-term consequences of uh, uh, cancelling some of very essential elective surgery. I think from the earlier uh, presentation, we saw that much of the surgeries we do are all essential surgeries. Uh, and therefore, we, we needed to look at a guideline that could really uh, rationalize which cases that you need to cancel. Next slide. Yeah. So the current issue that we have uh, at the moment in our hospitals is that uh, there's a delay in diagnosis and therefore that puts uh, us in a very awkward position in terms of providing emergency care. So at the moment, our lead time for, for turnaround time for COVID tests is really taking like 48, 72 hours and therefore will have many patients in the suspect group. And that means that uh, for you doing surgery, you need to provide uh, PPE 
and, uh, and that again impacts on your very limited resources. Now, again, the lack of guidelines on management of major surgery. I think as SADIC, we've uh, done a movement within South Africa, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and uh, Botswana. We are looking at how best can we get the guidelines that we can use in the region. So we've worked out a package that probably should compel uh, the various governments in Southern Africa to ensure that the guidelines are made available so as to guide the frontline workers. And uh, the issue of post-anesthesia care for COVID-19 suspects. And this is a big thing because what we have at the moment is a COVID isolation center. And this is where we take patients who are confirmed positive. Now, for those who are in the suspect group, we realize that there are so many and therefore hospitals came up with some isolation units. But again, if you do complex surgery and then you take them in the isolation unit, that really compromises our care. So we are still looking at how best we can uh, ensure that we get the tests very quickly and then we get them into designated COVID uh, centers. Next slide. Yeah, so uh, some of the interventions that we've done at the moment is that uh, we've set up isolated ICUs specifically for COVID. And in the capital, we do have uh, a hospital, which is relatively new, and it's called negative pressure uh, ORs, uh, negative pressure ICU uh, rooms. And, and, and therefore, uh, these hospitals are also having COVID operating rooms. These are very, very specific uh, theater spaces. And uh, we've dotted some around the country, and we're still just in a process of ensuring that we do the guidelines for, for those hospitals. Now, the other thing is that we, we, we designated operating room for COVID suspects. These are very high risk patients, but we don't have a test. And therefore, they were not allowed to go to the COVID center. And therefore, we need to do them in our hospitals. And this is quite one of the emerging crises within the hospitals. Uh, for our emergency obstetrics, we did manage to get uh, uh, an, a mobile unit. We had some mobile units that were there for a very long time. So uh, we, we, we did get one and therefore we just stationed outside the, the Women and Children Hospital where we do emergency surgeries. Now, the other issue that uh, we've done is that we've set up a resource center for training because what we've seen is that infection prevention specific to COVID and more especially in the, uh, the operating room is quite very poor. So we've developed uh, a, a resource center that we do. We do various training like infection prevention, air management, and generally training of OR team to do a bit of simulation because this is a new this is a new normal. It seems uh, managing the airway is going to be a very ceremonial thing, and therefore we needed people to go through the various steps that they need to do for them to be protected of COVID. Uh, next slide. Yeah. So uh, now the strategic plan that we think is critical is. Uh, uh, for the national, this is really at the national level, because many of our district hospitals, that's where we do the bulk of the surgery. And therefore, we thought uh, doing a very urgent needs assessment in terms of equipment, infrastructure, and uh, A and E, ICUs and theater. And this is really uh, uh, with specific uh, domains like human resource, uh, commodities. We'll be looking at uh, drugs, looking at uh, 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 whether they have guidelines uh, or not. And I just want to mention that uh, the, the needs assessment becomes so critical because we only have one anesthesia provider pay most of our district hospitals. And therefore, most of the guidelines that we're talking about are really very, very specific to areas where there are so many providers. Uh, and therefore, that would uh, really impact if COVID did, did strike the district hospitals. And, uh, and that one anesthetist to, to do airway management safely might be a challenge. So we are thinking of training a team and including surgeons and including nurses to ensure that they get some aspect of uh, uh, air management and therefore they can assist the single individual. Now we are also looking at, uh, uh, the, uh, like I said, the designate uh, COVID or theaters in the district hospitals. And most of our district hospitals of only one theater. And that means that if there is COVID, then it means they, don't, they, run, they run out of options. And therefore, we are feeling that it would be very, very critical to do some regional uh, theaters within a couple of uh, kilometers to ensure that 
there's a theater that is really specific for, for COVID. And uh, the, the general feeling uh, uh, from, from, the, uh, from many anesthetists is that uh, probably they feel very, very isolated, especially that uh, COVID is, is quite contagious and people have seen from the media and this uh, uh, sensational reporting. So many of our members are thinking like, uh, what is their best option for now? Do they continue providing uh, uh, service in the midst of uh, caring for patients that they might not know if they have COVID? Next slide. So now, the, 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 this is just now to show one of the things that we've done. Uh, like in the obstetric unit, we do have uh, an isolated the emergency theater for COVID. And, uh, and the main isolation is that in Lusaka has operating rules, like I said, for confirmed COVID. And uh, they also have specific theaters for suspects. Now we are hoping to find a strategy for district hospitals, which might be very, very difficult because these are hospitals that have uh, issues with human resource, issues with commodities, they also have issues with uh, surgeons and all that. And we feel that uh, there's no magic uh, uh, solution to this, but we think we need, still need to sit with our colleagues uh, in surgery to ensure that we find a solution that would be very, very applied in their setting. And, and generally, uh, to confirm the location for recovery. Because apparently in the district hospitals, we don't have any recoveries. And therefore, we are feeling that maybe it would be just important to ensure that we get some center where they can pick, pick their patients and reserve those theaters only for emergencies. Next slide. Yeah, now for, for critical care, uh, we are anticipating that uh, there will be a surge. Our numbers are not very great in terms of uh, COVID-19, simply because probably we are not doing many testing. So we feel that after we do the facility assessment, we'll do the mapping where we think we can, uh, we can take COVID patients. And then thereafter, we'll do the quantification and procurement of many uh, respiratory care devices. And uh, we'll, we'll definitely go on to do the, the, the district level training because we can't ventilate everywhere. So we are thinking that probably it would be important to, to train the districts just to manage COVID and teach them on how to triage for those who need ventilation in the various isolation units that we are dotted around the, 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 the country. And, and, and then we've set up regional ICUs. We have about three, four in the country. We hope to ensure that we scale up and uh, uh, set up other ICUs in the, in the other regions. Next slide. Yeah, so this is basically to show how we've mapped uh, the country. If you look at it, I think many people are dotted along the line of Leo. So Lusaka is where the capital is. So we have about 22 ICU bed capacity. Then Livingstone, which is really at the bottom near Zimbabwe, we have eight bed capacity. And then we also have some around in Dola. And Dola is really near Congo. And Congo is quite a risk area. And we do have about eight bed capacity. So our feeling is that uh, we might not have many places for ventilating uh, patients because the human resource is not there. So we feel that we just need to look at how best we can do uh, a triage system from the district hospitals into these regional uh, ICUs. When that says the much anticipated uh, say in cases come. And the other issue at the moment is that uh, our district hospitals have no critical care capacity. The, the, the only person that is available there probably is an anesthetist who is uh, a non-physician. And in their training, we don't do much critical care for them. So we feel that we need to do a very quick training that would empower them just to identify those who would need critical care. And therefore, uh, probably transport them to these regional ICUs. Next slide. Yeah, now we've set up what we've called a critical care uh, leadership and referral. So from the national level, we'll have the national coordinator, then we have a multidisciplinary team, then in the regional ICUs, we also have uh, a leadership there and up to the district level. And then the issue here is that we just need to have flow and uniformity in terms of how we do things. Now, triaging and referral, like I said, will be referring from the districts to the regional ICUs. And uh, we've come up with triage tools. I think Lifebox has a very good triage tools. 
just use, using oxygen saturation to try and take it. And therefore, we do some transfer protocol and, 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 and a bit of communication and transport for this patient. Next slide. Yeah, now uh, education to scale up healthcare workers, because we know that critical care training is not offered to all people. So we are thinking of how can we upskill the, the skills of people who are non-critical. And this is really like everyone has talked about infection prevention, optimizing oxygen therapy, oxygen delivery devices, and triage tools. And this is a training that we are doing from uh, the national level, but we are also going out to train the districts and including some tertiary uh, hospitals. Uh, and we're also looking at uh, management skills that are specific to COVID-19. And this is with respect to AL management which everyone has agreed that it's a very high risk procedure and we need to protect uh, the very few anesthetists that are available. Next slide. So that was my last slide. So if there are questions, we, 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 we could answer them. Thank you, Christopher. I think we'll turn it over to, for some questions. And so Dr. Shaleshi is going to take over. Thank you uh, to all three of you for an excellent uh, presentation, informative presentation. Um, I do realize that uh, we um, are um, over our time limit for a couple of minutes, uh, but I would like to ask uh, at least a couple of questions to the presenters. Um, and we do understand if you have to um, leave uh, the meeting, we do understand. But for those of you that are able to stick around, um, we will um, answer some questions. We had received some questions uh, prior to um, tonight's session. If you still have questions, please continue to write them in the chat box. Uh, we will respond uh, via email or through our um, WhatsApp group uh, and we'll continue the discussions. So the first question is, um, and, you know, when you're using N95s, you see uh, different terms, like some might say 1860 versus 1860S. Um, does that have any significance? Uh, and associated with that uh, is if, it's, if the mask is too big for you, does that affect your um, uh, possibility of uh, getting infected? If Dr. Newton, maybe you can answer that question. Yeah, the first, the first question, I don't know about the numbers, maybe Saida does, but as far as the fitting of the mask, there, I would say unless there's somebody that specifically knows about how to fit the mask, it's difficult. But so I would, I would say that um, it does need to fit firmly around your nose and around your mouth. And, um, you know, I, I think that unless there's a specialist that has a special type of device to determine whether it fits appropriately, it's going to be difficult, but uh, it does need to fit firmly around your nose and your mouth. Uh, I don't know if Saeed, do you know anything about the numbers? Uh, See if you can unmute Saeed. There we go. Okay, so these are different, the 1860, the 1870, these are different sizes and different shapes of N95. They all are, N they all have N95 uh, filtering capabilities, uh, but these are different shapes and sizes that are offered. So some might suit one person more than another. And yes, uh, the key thing is, is to make sure that it fits well. So if the mask is too big for you, it's probably not the right one for you. Okay. Great, thank you for answering that. Um, Dr. Asaf, I'll, con I'll continue with you. Are you doing anything special in when you disinfect the OR after use by a COVID positive patient? So we have not, we have been, we have not had a COVID uh, positive, a known COVID positive patients, but we suspect, but we suspect that we have had COVID positive patients just because we are not testing. The other day we had a child uh, who had uh, Wilms tumor and had ground glass appearances and no meds, and we thought that that was a kid who was possibly COVID positive. Uh, we what we're doing mainly is we came up with our own bleach solution that we're using to disinfect, 
and the hospital has also come up with a disinfectant and they are doing they are doing the disinfection every 24 hours while we are doing a disinfection after each case with a bleach solution for all of our OR surfaces. Okay. How about how about Christopher? Yeah, yes. Uh, uh, we, with us, we are lucky in the sense that uh, we do have uh, uh, the National uh, uh, Research Institute for Public Health. So they do have a number of EHTs that are dotted around uh, uh, the hospitals. So when you do a case that is highly suspicious, so you inform them and they have a routine way of disinfecting the, 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 the theaters that give you the chemicals. But in our own routine, we are using UV light, using a lot of UV light to, to disinfect most of our theaters. And uh, for the theaters that are designated for, for COVID, we've not had a COVID positive patient, but we have a lot of suspects. For the suspects, we still uh, treat them as COVID. And therefore, we do have a resource where we have uh, the N95s. I think we did get quite a very good donation from Jack Ma from China. So well, we do have the full gear, you have the N95, the face shields, the goggles, and uh, we've been doing a lot of trainings for donning and doffing. The only thing that we've seen at the moment is that we, we, we isolated the surgeons. I think last week I was speaking to Professor Makasa that probably needed the surgeons on board to ensure that uh, they are also uh, trained in uh, donning, doffing, and them just understanding the whole uh, our process and as far as infection prevention is concerned. So we are doing something, but I think it's, it's, you still need quite a lot of advocates to ensure that they were, everyone is actually put on board. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent, hey, thank you so much. Hey Ben, just to, uh, uh, just to add, so one of the things that we got early on in uh, when we started thinking about COVID preparedness was we just went out in the market and bought some bleach and cleaning solutions. So buy that early on. Right now, I'm, today, Pakistan has started seeing its peak, but we had six weeks of time when we did not. And I suspect this is gonna be true for a lot of places that are not red right now. They're gonna get red sooner rather than late. They're, they're gonna get red at some point. You want to have enough supplies. You want to hold the, you want to get those supplies on your hands on those supplies right now. So please put cleaning uh, solutions on the list to buy. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, gonna change gears a little bit and ask, um, maybe um, Dr. Newton, I can start with you. Um, have, do you anticipate any change in coagulation profiles in these patients? Um, there have been some studies that have shown that these patients uh, could be pro uh, coagulant and related to uh, surgery and using uh, regional techniques such as a spinal anesthesia, um, are you worried about having more thrombotic risks in these patients? Yeah, I mean, you have to, it's a judgment call, right? Because what they're, what they're kind of looking at now is D-dimers to see if there's any higher incidence of having thrombotic events. And if you're not able to measure that, it's going to have to be a clinical um, measurement. And so if you have someone that you suspect is having some vascular thrombotic events, if there's any sort of... Um, lesions in their toes where it looks like some sort of rash, but it's probably a thrombotic event or they're having respiratory compromise. You have to really seriously consider if this is a thrombotic event and, and whether you do a spinal or not. I mean, it's, it's something that I think that if you could avoid manipulating the airway and do a, doing a spinal, that may be a good thing to do. So I think you have to look at all the risk and the benefits of what type of anesthetic you want to do. But I think I would do anything I could to try to avoid um, these aerosolized-producing uh, procedures like intubation and extubation. I would try to use regional blocks and spinals. Excellent. Um, one last question, and uh, whoever would like to take this, um, go ahead, feel free. Um, so what is the impact of doing a major surgery uh, in terms of the progression of the COVID-19 disease itself. We do know that, um, you know, your immune status would be affected. Um, and if you do major surgery, do you anticipate that it would have 
uh, an impact on the on the patient's immune status and potentially worsen um, their COVID-19 progression. Um, Saida or Christopher, do you have any comments? So we know from the recent studies that have come out that the mortality is about 20%. Uh, if you do an elective procedure on a COVID patient, if I'm not wrong, this is what came out recently. So yes, it, I, I, I don't know how to answer the, uh, the impact on immunity, but surgery in a COVID positive patient does carry a, a higher risk for morbidity and mortality. Maybe for, for me, uh, we don't have much uh, data, but I think what I can say is that uh, for COVID positive patients, that's the reason why we are emphasizing on testing, having uh, uh, the test and understanding whether surgery is essential or non essential. But it will be very, very critical because we do know that surgery itself is a stress and therefore that impacts on immunity. It's possible that it can. Uh, uh, worsen the progression of COVID. So it's important that for most of us in the resource uh, limited settings, where the turnaround time for testing is quite not so good. And the times we are doing quite very big surgeries, uh, in patients who are high risk. So it will be very, very critical that we can get a test. And therefore it will help us charge patients and be rational in terms of doing uh, the surgeries. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I agree with that. I think somebody that has comes in with some respiratory compromise, if it's from COVID or from influenza or some pneumonia, their risk of having surgery and some sort of respiratory illness, their, their morbidity and mortality is definitely going to go up. And so if it's emergency surgery, it's emergency surgery. You don't have really many options. But if it's not an emergency case, then uh, you should certainly wait until the symptoms are away. And if something if you can't test, but they have symptoms, you're just definitely going to have to assume it's COVID and wait uh, until that's over with. Okay. Well, um, I really appreciate everybody's time. Um, and uh, if you have more questions, please continue to send us those questions. Um, I'll turn it over back to uh, Sherry to close us out. Yeah, the study that I was uh, uh, was coding, you can look it up in Lancet. It's about a 20% mortality rate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Drs. Newton, Asaf, Shonda, and Seleshi. This was a fantastic and very relevant um, session tonight. Thank you to all of our participants for taking your time and um, spending it with us. We really appreciate it. I'd like to turn it over this session for a minute to Claire to talk about the WhatsApp group that we have going. Yes, so I know we may not have gotten to all of your questions, but we have started a WhatsApp group for the series. Um, and you can continue to ask questions in this WhatsApp group or share information about what's happening with COVID in your area. So you can scan this QR code with your phone. We'll also send a link to your email. And if you have any other questions or if you're having trouble joining the WhatsApp group, you can email us at echo at assistinternational.org. Thanks. Excellent. And I really would encourage you to join the WhatsApp chat if you haven't. There's a lot of lively conversation and questions that are going on in um, knowledge sharing. It's an, it's an excellent format. Um, we're going to put up a quick poll as you leave. And we would love for you to please um, answer the few questions that are on the poll. And while that poll is going up, I just would like to again thank all of our doctors for this wonderful presentation. Um, all, of, all of you for joining with us. I'd like to thank um, GE Foundation for sponsoring this. And um, this lecture series is presented by Vanderbilt University Medical Center and Vanderbilt Institute for Global Health. So thank you all very much for participating this morning. And, and please fill out the poll before you leave. We'll hold the meeting open for a few minutes.